My name is Stefan and I'm an assistant professor at the European Studies Department at the University of Amsterdam. And it's my pleasure to introduce Matthias Möschel today as the second speaker in this series. Matthias is head of the Legal Studies Department at Central, Europe Central European University, which recently relocated, as perhaps all of you know, to Vienna. Uh, Matthias held various uh, research and teaching positions at different uh, continental European and US American universities, amongst others at the University of Paris, uh, Nanterre La Défense, and at NYU. The reason why we ask Matthias, and he uh, and uh, uh, gratefully he accepted to be part of this series, is that he Matthias was, was at the forefront and still is at the forefront of bringing critical race theory to a European legal context. His in 2014 he published a book, which was called uh, which is called Law, Lawyers, and Race. And this, and this book is still, to my knowledge, the only comprehensive monograph that addresses these issues of critical race theory in a continental European context in, uh, uh, more comprehensively. So without further ado, uh, I would uh, hand over to Matthias and to his uh, short statements and short presentation. It's a pleasure to have you, Matthias. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. So it's an honor to be with you, even in this virtual space. Uh, and, and, and of course, I should make a disclaimer. Yes, maybe academically, it might be one of the few like monographical works going on in critical race theory in, in Europe. But of course, there's a whole lot more happening sort of like in, in maybe in, in articles in smaller pieces across the continent and and then also movement you know movement wise there's quite a bit of movement you know the center for intersectional justice in 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 berlin so so you know there are other centers and and so so i'm not claiming that you know i'm, I'm leading anything so there's like it's just like going with a certain wave where that aspect uh, had been uh I don't know, maybe maybe academically uh, less worked on, uh, but certainly certainly there's a number of others working on, on on CRT in the European context. But and in some ways maybe this is why we can also have this event at the moment because I was thinking and I was wondering if some years ago it would have even been possible to have the series that you're having that you're running now at the moment. Uh, uh, would have existed. So for me, in some ways, it's a sign that the discussions are evolving, that either there's a, an awakening to the issue, that Europe is waking up or mainland Europe is waking up to its amnesia, to its race amnesia, whatever you want to call it. Um, and another thing uh, that I was thinking about is that, you know, you're in Amsterdam. And so I attended years ago, and maybe because I saw Maria Barty, who uh, wrote her PhD at the same time as I did at the, at the European University Institute, um, I attended what was then the first year in 2008, the Black Europe Summer School in Amsterdam. And what was interesting that that had just been renamed to this uh, to this name from what before was a migration school. Um, and so a number of American students had asked the organizers, so I'm sorry, why is there no discussion about the question of race, about the question of blackness, about the question of colonial aspects? And so that kind of triggered this shift um, to calling the summer school Black Europe's uh, summer school. And so it was the first time in 2008 that it took place, I still think that it's happening and it's uh, Filomena Acid, Kwame Nimako and, and others that are co-organizing this summer school or used to co-organize the summer school. So in some ways I did think that it was, it was uh, it's a sign about certain things moving, that certain discussions are taking place and at the same time, even though we're moving forward, what we're also seeing is a sort of like backlash backlash against uh, questions and maybe in the in the Euro in the US context it would be correct to talk about backlash in Europe it's I would even call it a front lash a sort of like preventive lash against race studies at least in mainland Europe because you cannot say that critical race theory has really set foot in Europe so far uh, so it's still marginal it's still marginalized 
Um, and so, so it's interesting to see how, uh, in particular in France, there have been uh, quite a few uh, issues taking place, but also Germany, which is partly the discussion uh, topic of, of today, or at least the contextualized aspect of things that I observe more broadly at the European level, um, that you see this lash at critical race studies, post-colonial studies, intersectionality, uh, terms such as Islamophobia as well, so that all of that is put into a sort of uh, into a sort of bucket against which uh, various actors, and we're not just talking about far right actors, are reaching out and lashing out too. So I find it quite interesting in terms of looking at the arguments that are raised both in the United States, but in similar ways in Europe against critical race theory. Some of these arguments are as old as critical race theory. Some of them are newer. And it was just like before I, I leave it to my introductory statements, but I thought it was interesting to, you know, put this series also into a broader context uh, within which it is taking place and the risks that the organizers are taking with that as well. So uh, uh, I, I'm not sure how the situation is in the United States, in, in, in the Netherlands, but uh, in France, certainly organizing events on whiteness, on race, uh, you have the security services coming in along and thinking about, well, uh, are we sure that we're going to do this? Um, so in terms of the arguments that are being raised against critical race theory, in the modern, like Trumpian, but also European context, it's sort of like in Europe in particular, it's sort of, well, you're just importing US stuff. You're importing US race consciousness, political correctness. So all of these arguments have been around quite a bit of time. Um, the second one is also about divisiveness. Critical race theory is divisive. It's all about identity. So you hear that quite a bit. On the academics, then you have anti-Semitic, that critical race theory is anti-Semitic. And maybe we'll get to that when we talk a little bit about the German context. Um, then at the academic side of things, you can also hear more liberal scholars. So we're not talking about Trumpian scholars that say, well, critical race theory is non-nuanced. It's, it's uh, activist and not scientific. So you're not being objective here. Um, and then that it somehow poses dangers to universality and the values of enlightenment. So there's a collection of arguments from various angles that come along. And the other one that is a classic is also that, well, what about class? Uh, so, so, so that always comes up uh, as another argument of more left-leaning scholars that are saying, well, you're uh, neglecting class in all of this. So again, I won't uh, go into, maybe we'll get afterwards into some of the arguments and how we can counter these arguments, uh, some more easier than others. But again, uh, so in, in terms of you know, organizing the series, I'm very happy to be intervening here and I look forward to the questions and to the discussions. Wonderful. So let's uh, jump right into it. But before we do so, could I ask those who feel comfortable um, to turn on their cameras to do so just because it helps with the conversation nature of, of this event to actually see more than just names? Um, so Matthias, you just gave us a little bit of a background of what the critiques are of, of um, critical race theory and situated the pushback for us. Um, but then I don't think necessarily everyone really understands what critical race theory entails, how it developed um, in the US context and what its applications to law are. So if you could elaborate on that. I mean, that in and of itself would be, I mean, it's, it's the subject of a whole course. So I'll try to be very, uh, very concise. Um, there's various narratives in the way that critical race theory emerged. Uh, some of them locate them in student movements at Harvard. Others uh, see that in Berkeley, in, in Berkeley, there were some movements. Certainly it happened in law schools, in American law schools, or at least the critical race theory that, that coined this term, because of course in other departments and uh, certain similar things happened. Um, but law schools, so students got together and then later on academics, young academics of color, so students of color, academics of color, um, under the aegis of critical legal studies attended some of these critical legal studies workshops and critical legal studies had been heavily involved in critiquing domination in the United States in law and the contribution of law to hegemony um, 
And uh, but what critical legal studies had failed to do at that time is include the question of racial domination, partly as well of gender domination, in that in their analyses. And so critical race scholars are the first ones got together in a separate workshop. Um, and that seen in 1987, seen as sort of the birth, the semi-official birth date of critical race theory, where these scholars then got together and developed a set of um, tenets uh, that critical race theorists would subscribe to. And where law certainly played a central role in understanding the way that law contributed to the subordination of racial minorities in the in the American uh, in the American reality. So it was clearly an American initially an American history, a sort of a, one might even say somehow parochial history. There were some internal critiques that it had been too focused on what they call the black white uh, binary, uh, meaning that there was too much focus on the question of the experience of African Americans. But that was pretty much early on, I would say, already the critiques had been made about the subordination, racial subordination by a law of Asian Americans, of Latinos, of Native Americans for sure. So you had all these issues branching out fairly early on and with the key notion of intersectionality, certainly the multidimensionality of race discrimination was also present from the very beginning. And many as well, many of the critical race scholars were women of color. So the overlap of, um, of, uh, of uh, race and gender was there from the very inception of, of critical race theory. Now, um, what Crenshaw describes in her own words, what critical race theory did was a double intervention. So Kimberly Crenshaw is one of the leading scholarship scholars, and she also coined the term um, of critical race theory. And she says critical race theory did a double intervention. Um, it did a left intervention into more traditional U.S. anti-discrimination law in the sense that critical race theory critiqued some of these individualized, uh, non-structural approaches to anti-discrimination law that existed in more traditional liberal scholarship and thought about anti-discrimination law. And at the same time, critical race theory also brought, and this I already mentioned, a race intervention into critical legal studies meaning that critical race scholars highlighted the fact of race uh, being a key part, a structural part of American society and of American law and the contribution uh, to uh, the domination, subordination of racial minorities in that, in that reality. So very briefly to, uh, uh, I tried myself uh, in, in my work then to look at how it came about that is sort of like almost two timelines, if you think about it even more broadly. So apart from the, uh, the I'm not saying micro, uh, micro emergence and the tenets of critical race theory, um, but it was a result of two timelines. One was how critical race theorists were able to analyze uh, the timeline of what uh, law did to US minorities um, to be subordinated. So looking at the case law of the US Supreme Court and the statutes and the history, critical legal scholars had a really strong argument in showing the continuities of that subordination, how it morphed for sure, because of course slavery was abolished, but then it changed into other forms of discrimination into segregation. And so similarly for other racial minorities in the United States, you had those timelines that were clearly visible, unearthing them and showing that was one of the main aspects of that timeline. And the other timeline is more about American legal scholarship as such. So it answers a little bit of question, well, why did it emerge in that context in law schools? And that is more about jurisprudence. And so if you think about it there as well, there was this golden age, you know, 17, I mean, golden age for a certain type of, of person, uh, of course, at that time it was white Catholic males, but um, in the jurisprudence of the US Supreme Court, the golden age, that developed from the early years when Madison versus Marbury and so constitutional jurisprudence happened. And then you had a sort of age of formalism and then comes legal realism and out of legal realism then comes uh, postmodern movements and critical race theorists are then anchored within what has been defined postmodern legal movements and there's feminist legal theory, law and economics, law and literature. So, uh, so there's a number of approaches that Gary Minda has been used, uh, has been uh, coining uh, postmodern legal uh, movements. So, so again, it's just to locate a little bit 
some of that in this uh, in this reality. Um, and uh, so again, that's what I would say at the moment about about critical race theory and its emergence in the United States. Thank you so much. That, that was a very comprehensive and uh, very clear overview of how kind of like critical race theory emerged in the US. But how, as you were kind of like one of the first scholars who brought kind of like critical race theory and applied it in the European legal context, <coughs> excuse me, um, and advocated for this application of critical race theory in European legal context, I would be particularly interested in kind of like how, why should European lawyers use critical race theory in their legal analysis and or legal practice? And what does, and you also mentioned anti-discrimination law and the critique, the left intervention that critical race theory did in, um, in US anti-discrimination law. So, and that would be the second question, kind of like what does critical race theory in Europe allow us to see what anti-discrimination law does not permit us to see? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. I mean, uh, one of the things would be the easy answer and the quick answer would be to say, well, look, uh, do a similar thing to what CRT scholars did in the US. Look at what the past and history has done of European law has done to racial minorities in Europe, more broadly speaking. And so, again, uh, uh, how they've been in, in affected by certain pieces of legislation in the past, whether that's colonialism, whether that's anti-Semitism, whether that's anti-Gypsyism, and looking at the continuities and the ruptures, I, I think the ruptures are interesting and important as well, because of course in the United States it's easier to say, well, the US Supreme Court, it was always the same institution, whereas in Europe, that you find often as well, you know, World War I, World War II, the regimes changed, you went from monarchy to democracy, but when you take an angle of a racial angle, apart maybe from the Holocaust, uh, the other things didn't follow necessarily these kind of ruptures as much. If you're thinking about anti-Gypsyism, if you're thinking about colonialism, that didn't end with World War II, it continued after that. So even these regimes that maybe said, well, you know, something happened in the past, but after World War II, things got better. It's not exactly these kind of timelines that we're looking at. And when you're following the question of anti-Gypsyism and Islamophobia as well, uh, then you get into a whole other set of discussions. So, so I think looking at the broader structures, the broader history, and then looking at you know what remained ingrained in in some of these uh, questions of European history, legal history, and the present, what is happening today and now, that allows, and that's an angle that critical race theorists have always looked at and used to do. Um, so I think using that and, and doing the same to Europe and look into, and I think it enriches legal scholarship. I think there is, you know, this may be one counter argument to the argument that is often brought that critical race theory doesn't enrich and is unnuanced. Actually, it adds nuance to legal analysis in Europe, where so far we've been limited to very doctrinal approaches. Maybe feminist legal studies has gained some traction and some legitimacy but again that's another way of looking at european law through the lens of race and how you know european legislation case law uh, and um, and institutions have not been race neutral as we often like them to be um so on the second question um anti-discrimination law so it's true that in certain ways, anti-discrimination law, arguably in Europe, has already a certain more structural approach. If I take the European anti-discrimination law in particular, we had gender discrimination. So anti-discrimination law started with gender and with nationality discrimination, if especially if you consider EU law. So there is something more structural. Nevertheless, uh, I do think that even here, uh, the scope often of anti-discrimination law, especially if you talk about EU anti-discrimination law, is narrow. It's a fairly narrow, it's limited to employment, provision of goods and services. Okay, if I take Article 14 of the European Convention on Human Rights, then I might get at other aspects. But overall, anti-discrimination law remains limited to certain domains. Uh, and if 
and critical race theory broadens those domains to everything, the structures, the racial structures, the racial state, as David Theo Goldberg talks about. So that remains to large extent untouched by EU anti-discrimination law uh, and critical race theory instead allows us to look beyond that. Racial borders, profiling, intellectual property law, you know, administrative law, so, and establishing the links to history. So I do think that critical race theory really adds in that sense, in looking beyond what anti-discrimination law allows us, Article 14 of the European Convention of Human Rights allows us from the scope to go there, and the Biao versus Denmark decision is very interesting from that perspective, but here then we're narrower because we're talking again about individual litigation. So we're back into this more narrow individual rights approach and the remedies is essentially money. We're not getting any structural remedies. I'll stop here. I see the I, hand I, was, going on. I was just about to stop you because I promised that we would have enough time for a conversation. So, because I think you just gave us a lot of rich material and, and actually quite passionately advocated for the application of critical race theory um, to European legal systems. So in your work, you have done so, you have applied it to um, the French system, but also the German system, which is um, the topic of today's conversation. So maybe you could illustrate um, what, uh, how uh, critical race theory works if applied to, uh, to German speaking systems, and more specifically, what you mean when you use the term um, colorblindness as you describe German legal systems. So colorblindness is, of course, borrowed from the American notion and the famous dissent of Justice Harlan in, uh, in his case in the 1896 uh, Plessy v. Ferguson judgment. Um, so uh, again, maybe I should rather say race blindness, because possibly in Europe, some, you know, some ways in, in defining race go beyond the question of color. So if you talk about Roma and Jewish, so, so again, the question of color, but I use that term borrowing it from critical uh, scholarship, critical race scholarship. But again, I think two things, uh, very broadly what I talked about when I mentioned continental European colorblindness, I said it encompasses two phenomena, legal and political elimination of race. So there is a sort of tendency of saying, well, you know, yes, the Holocaust happened, but it was over in 45 and then we did everything to repair it. Colonialism, well, it happened somewhere else. It happened in Africa, so it didn't affect, so, and that's passed as well. It leaves a set of gaps open on the question of anti-Gypsyism and the question of, of, uh, of Islamophobia and of anti-Asian racism. So, so again, I'm not trying to say, but again, there is a sort of displacement in terms of time, but also geography about what happened with race in Europe. And I think that is one movement that, that uh, this colorblindness does. Uh, which allows Europe then to stand there as the clean whitewashed sort of, uh, um, uh, not saying victim, but you know, clean and whitewashed conscious pilot, you know, we washed our hands from it and that's it. The second consequence of that is also that this colorblindness ingrains a sort of judicial construction of absence of racism. And that is similar to what happens in the US in certain ways, but at the same time, you define racism in a very narrow way, in a very intentional way, and not in a structural way, which then ultimately seems to be that if I looked at case law, even from the European Court of Human Rights, the racists are very few and very few bad apples rather than seeing the structural aspects of it. So, so I do think that this kind of understanding of racism really allows to displace these things in various ways and whitewash not only politically and legally in, in many ways what happens in Europe. Now, of course, the German specificities are then uh, are important to note. First of all, there was already sort of and a colleague of mine, Cengiz Barskamas, has written on this, and he defined it as sort of this German exceptionalism, where, of course, Germany, as being the perpetrator of the Holocaust, has a very specific reason to say, well, you know, it's over, we shouldn't be speaking about race. And that poses, so again, what I described as the overall continental European colorblindness then plays out in different ways in nuances in France, where you have universalism playing, Republican universalism playing a certain role. And in Germany, this German exceptionalism with the Holocaust, where this heavy focus and race being read almost exclusively in terms of the Jewish Holocaust, again, I should say the Jewish Holocaust, sort of like forgets the broader aspects, it, so it makes it allows for 
arguments to say we should stop talking about race because of this horrible thing happening. And so that doesn't allow race being used in any other way, in any other exception. And so, um, and it forgets, first of all, it forgets all the other forms of racism that took place as well. So there's some work being done now in Germany, especially historically as well on, on, uh, on what happened in, in, uh, in Namibia and in Africa. Uh, maybe some awakening to the reality of, of Roma victims, not only of the Holocaust, but of contemporary forms of racism. And since we speak about the German speaking context, and I'm in Austria as well at the moment, you know, there's a number of questions being raised uh, on the question of, of racism and anti-begging laws. Um, so again, I think ironically, uh, the work that needs to be done in particular in the German speaking context is that on the one hand, you need to take race less seriously, because if we keep applying this logic of race and racism is the Jewish Holocaust, that's what you're going to ask from someone to be defined a racist. But that's very narrow, and it's extremely difficult to reach that, that threshold. So on the one hand, you need to bring that threshold down, so take it less seriously almost, and on the other hand, take it more seriously, because then you need to think about the other forms of racism that exist that I already mentioned and bringing those into the picture. So I certainly think that for the German context, there's particular obstacles in that sense. And on top of that, in the legal term, and I'm, 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 I know your hand will come up soon, in legal terms, uh, I think as well, what we've seen in particular with the introduction to the anti-discrimination law, the German legal private doctrine was extremely hostile to, uh, to the introduction of the AGG, of the Allgemeines Gleichbehandlungsgesetz. Uh, and so it's really interesting to read their writings on, on their virulent writings against introducing anti-discrimination law more broadly. So, so I do think that that is very particular to the German reality that I have not seen as much in, with, in other uh, continental European contexts.